Hello everyone and welcome back to Ways of the World, a brief global history with sources. As we begin our study of commerce and culture 600 to 1450 and we're going to start with the Silk Roads exchange across Eurasia. Travel on the Silk Roads. This Chinese ceramic figurine from the Tong Dynasty 618-907 CE shows a group of musicians riding on a camel along the famous Silk Road commercial network that long linked the civilizations of Western and Eastern Eurasia. The bearded figures represent Central Asian merchants while the others depict the Chinese. So let's think about contextualization here. What does this image suggest about the relationship between the Chinese and the nomadic people of Central Asia? Well, the figurine depicts Chinese and Central Asian merchants playing music together on the camel suggests that the cultures had important connections with each other, particularly in the realm of commercial exchange, which had broader cultural implications. The growth of the Silk Roads. Eurasia is often divided into inner and outer zones with different ecologies. Outer Eurasia was relatively warm, well watered, uh, that'd be China, India, Middle East, and the Mediterranean. But inner Eurasia, harsher, much drier climate, and much of it was a pastoral uh, area. That's particularly Eastern Russia and Central Asia. Now the set products were exchanged for agricultural products and manufactured goods. And we see a creation of second wave civilizations and imperial states in the last five centuries BCE that included efforts to control the pastoral peoples. Trading networks did uh, best when large states provided security for trade. When the Roman and Chinese empires anchored commerce, would be a great example, in the 7th and 8th centuries, the Byzantine Empire, the Abbasid Dynasty, and the Tong Dynasty created a belt of strong states to support that trade. And in the 13th and 14th centuries, again, the Mongol Empire controlled almost the entirety of the Silk Roads. All right, uh, the Silk Roads. For 2,000 years, goods, ideas, technologies, and diseases made their way across Eurasia on the several routes of the Silk Roads. So based on the map, how did the geography and environment present obstacles to trade along the Silk Roads? Well, for goods to travel between the Mediterranean, China, and India, they had to traverse mountains, across deserts, ford rivers, and pass through different climates. In addition, they needed to pass through different states. All these obstacles meant that the Silk Roads were winding and efficient and often changed from one journey to another as conditions changed. All right, goods in transit. A vast array of goods traveled along the Silk Roads, often by camel. Uh, mostly luxury goods for the elite. The high cost of transport did not allow for the movement of staple goods. Uh, silk symbolized the Eurasian exchange system, hence the term Silk Roads. And at first, China had a monopoly on silk technology. But by the 6th century CE, other peoples produced silk. Uh, silk was used as currency in Central Asia. It was a symbol of high status and only developed in Western Europe in the 12th century. Now, the volume of trade was small, but of economic and social importance. Peasants along the Yangtze River uh, Delta of southern China produced market goods, silk, paper, porcelain, uh, instead of crops, and well-placed individuals could make enormous, pro enormous profits on silk. All right, this is a Muslim silk hanging in a Christian cathedral. This 13th century silk hanging uh, created in the Islamic world found a home in the Christian cathedral of Barcelona in Spain, illustrating that this precious fabric moved between civilizations. Around the seated figures is the text of the essential Muslim affirmation, there is no God but God. So again, let's contextualize, contextualize here. What does the presence of a Muslim silk hanging in a Christian cathedral say about the global connections of this period? Well, the image shows a practitioner of a religion developed in the Middle East hanging a fabric from East Asia in a cathedral in Europe. This epitomizes the cultural and economic interactions of the third wave civilizations. All right, cultures in transit. Uh, cultural transmission was more important than exchange of goods. 
Uh, for example, we'll look at the case of Buddhism. Buddhism spread along the Silk Roads through Central and East Asia, had always appealed to the merchants, and the conversion was heavy in the oasis cities of Central Asia. But conversion was voluntary. Many of the Central Asian cities became centers of learning and commerce, and it spread much more slowly among Central Asian pastoralists. In China, the religion of for, or excuse me, it was the religion of foreign merchants or rulers for centuries, and Buddhism was transformed during its spread. For example, Buddhist texts and cave temples in Donghong. And that's an example here. Donghong, located in western China at a critical junction of the Silk Road trading network, it was also a center of Buddhist learning, painting, and sculpture as that religion made its way from India to China and beyond. In some 492 caves, um, see carved out of rock between 400 and 1400 CE, a remarkable gallery of Buddhist art has been preserved. In this image, the Buddha is surrounded by other enlightened beings or bodhisattvas. Disease in transit. Now, the major population centers of the Afro-Eurasian world developed characteristic disease patterns and ways to deal with them. Long-distance trade meant exposure to unfamiliar diseases. An early case is a great epidemic in Athens in 430-429 BCE. During the Roman and Han empires, smallpox and measles devastated both populations. 534 to 750 CE, the bubonic plague from India ravaged the Mediterranean world. The Black Death spread thanks to the Mongol Empire's unification of much of Eurasia in the 13th and 14th centuries. And it could have been the bubonic plague, anthrax, or a collection of epidemic diseases. And it killed as much as one half of the European population between 1346 and 1348. Uh, there's a similar death toll in China and parts of the Islamic world. The Central Asian steppes were badly affected and it really undermined Mongol power. And disease exchange gave Europeans an advantage when they finally reached the Western Hemisphere after 1500. And that concludes our study of the Silk Roads exchange across Eurasia. I will see you guys next time for the Sea Roads.